As we learned last time, the locomotive superiority hypothesis proposes that dinosaurs owed their success over Pseudosuchians and other Triassic groups to the way they moved. This idea isn't a new one and was first seriously proposed in the 70s. In 1974, Bakker and Galton published a paper discussing the differences in dinosaur and general thecodont anatomy. Today, thecodont is considered an outdated group name. This term was previously used to refer to the animals within the broader archosaurian lineage that aren't dinosaurs, pterosaurs or crocodilians. This means that thecodontia is paraphyletic. It contains the common ancestor of a group, but not all of its descendants, and thus isn't a real evolutionary group, but more of a wastebasket. Traditional groupings like Thecodontia were made on the basis of shared features, such as the teeth that sit within a socket that give Thecodontia its name. These days we focus more on shared ancestry when defining groups, rather than arbitrary traits or modes of life. Because of this, we split Archosauria into different groups than those traditionally used, the two main groups being the Ornithodira, which contains the archosaurs more closely related to birds than to crocodiles, and the Pseudosuchia, which, as you may have guessed, contains those more closely related to crocodiles than to birds. Although Bakker and Galton's work is most important for our purposes, as it first proposed the locomotive superiority hypothesis, the paper was primarily used as evidence for monophyly or evolutionary unity of dinosauria. If we go back to our phylogenetic trees... Monophyletic groups contrast paraphyletic clades like Thecodontia in that they include the last common ancestor of a group and all its descendants. In this paper, Bakker and Galton were arguing that rather than different branches of dinosaurs having come from several ancestors, the group was united by one common ancestor. This is what is universally believed to be the case today. But back to dinosaur locomotion. Bakker and Galton determined that the way dinosaurs moved gave them an edge in survival over Pseudosuchians and other groups. They summed it up nicely, saying, The dinosaur radiation was based on a concentration of behavioural, physiological and anatomical adaptations for high sustained running speeds that made them irresistible predators and competitors to contemporary Thecodontians and larger mammal-like reptiles. Their work was done by comparing the relevant locomotor anatomy, such as the bones of the legs, feet and pelvis, of dinosaurs and other animals, to estimate how well they worked relative to each other. Over the next decade or so, others weighed in on this new hypothesis, with most studies focusing on the differences between dinosaur upright posture compared to the sprawling or semi-erect postures of contemporary synapsids and pseudosuchians. Bonaparte in 1984 considered that some Pseudosuchians, namely the carnivorous Rausuchids, had also developed an erect limb posture, which can potentially show that these animals had just as improved movement as the dinosaurs. However, he determined that the dinosaur arrangement was superior, focusing particularly on the positioning of the femur and hips and highlighting the way that dinosaurs stand tiptoed rather than flat-footed as the Pseudosuchians primarily did. In 1986, Parrish took this further and looked at other groups of Pseudosuchians that had developed an erect posture. Again, he noted that this posture shift from sprawling to upright could well have provided an advantage in terrestrial habitats. And he credited the dinosaur foot as well as other subtle anatomical differences as major advantages over all Pseudosuchian groups. Whilst of course this is still important work, it being the 70s and 80s, these studies didn't have the same computational power that we have today to build digital models and run complex biomechanical calculations to test how anatomy relates to potential behaviour. They were constrained by the technology of the day, and so were restricted in the methods they could use in this regard. And they were simply working with fewer specimens and knowledge than we have now. In particular, our understanding of archosaur relationships wasn't anywhere near as precise as it is today, and although it's clear from this work that opinion was shifting, until recently at the time, dinosaurs had still generally been considered cold-blooded, slow-moving, unintelligent failures of evolution. The next decade saw a boom in paleontological research and discovery, and of course, not everyone was on board with the locomotion superiority hypothesis. Next time we will look at some of these opposing views. We hope you will join us, and if you want any more information about the locomotive superiority hypothesis or the Dawn Dinos project, then please visit our website, which will be linked below. We would also like to thank the European Research Council for funding this project. 